The next Renegade University weekend is going to be amazing. It will be in my hometowns of Oakland and San Francisco the weekend of April 24th to the 26th. On Friday, I'll give a VIP walking tour of the rich Renegade history of San Francisco before we have happy hour, dinner, and an after-dinner lounge at some of my favorite bars and restaurants in the city. On Saturday, the dazzling Daniel Coffeen, a star guest of the Unregistered podcast, whose Nietzsche course for Renegade University immediately became one of our best sellers, will lead a discussion on seeing the world differently, with pleasure, in an era of meanness, narrow rationality, and dumb partisanship. Then, I will discuss the remarkable evolution of American political discourse from uptight puritanical rigidity to the norm-shattering interventions of our current clown prince president. I will also present the findings from the research for my upcoming book on the history of renegade American popular culture subverting authoritarian regimes around the world. There will also be an open bar happy hour for all attendees on Saturday night, followed by what I think will be the highlight of the entire weekend, a party at the East Oakland urban farm that is now the underground headquarters of Renegade University. RU weekends are the highlights of my whole year, and I can't wait for this one. I hope to see you there. Go to renegadeuniversity.com backslash live for more info and tickets. That's renegadeuniversity.com backslash live. My guest this week was a national celebrity for advocating for the liberation of women from their traditional gender roles. Now he's a pariah among feminists for promoting the liberation of men from their traditional roles. But he has always maintained that he has simply stood for the freedom for all of us to choose our own roles. This is my interview with Warren Farrell. I'm in a place I've been wanting to come for a very long time. I'm in the beautiful house of Warren Farrell in Mill Valley, California, in Marin County. And Warren, I... I've been wanting to have you on the show, as I told you before we started rolling, for a long time. I just haven't been able to get down here until now. It's a it's great honor because I find your career to be one of the most fascinating I've ever known about mm -hmm. as, as a public intellectual, as a thinker, and an activist. Um, and it's so rich. And the interesting thing is I had never heard of you until about whenever the red pill came out. I guess it was three years ago. Yes, like yeah, about three years ago. Um, and I was stunned that I had never heard of you because of because of how rich your career has been and how important it's been in so many ways, in different ways. And, I, and we can talk about why, but I think it's generational. I think people older than me know you and people younger than me might know you because mm -hmm. of the Red Pill, the mm -hmm. movie, the film, the documentary film by Cassie J, in which you're a, one of the featured speakers. But I want to get into that. But what I really want to do is sort of introduce the audience to, to you and your life. And then we can talk and, and, and sort of talk about your ideas as we mm -hmm. do that. Because your life and your career, as I said, is so long and so rich and so important. And I think a lot of people don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And I think also your ideas become easier to understand or mm -hmm. maybe easier to uh, accommodate if people understand the context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're uniquely suited and uh, skilled at interweaving the personal with the political. So I think this is your almost in, in many ways the perfect unregistered guest. This is mm -hmm. fans of the show know that's what we do here. And I don't think there's anyone who could be better at it than you. Mm -hmm. So why don't we start at the beginning? Mm -hmm. Well, let's actually, let's do this. I mean, for people who don't know who you are, you are sort of often characterized in very shorthand ways in the media as the father of the men's rights movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that may or may not be true. Uh, I found you to be in the red pill to be the most interesting and the most sympathetic of all the representatives of the movement mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons we can talk about. But let's go back to the beginning now. Mm -hmm. You were from New Jersey, born in New Jersey, right? Yes, exactly. That's sort of a, you're a boomer. Actually born in New York. Okay. And then my family um, moved to New Jersey when I was about five, six years of age. And then um, came up, to, uh, and this is 1943, and mm -hmm. then I was born. And so um, then moved to Europe when I was uh, 15 and 16. And that really was very um, crucial for me because um, I had been uh, opposing the um, McCarthy era in my school and opposing my uh, McCarthy era in the 50s uh, in a high school um, led me to being accused of being a communist. Oh. And so and then I went over to Europe 
uh, when I was um, 14 and 15. And the people in Europe said, well, you know, the Soviet Union, the United States, they're pretty much the same thing. They're bully nations. Uh, they're self-righteous. They think they know everything. And, um, you know, and they're just two of a kind. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that was really helpful for me because here I had felt very lonely and isolated. And and suddenly um, by, by saying that we should, and what I was saying in high school was, uh, you know, we should be able to be open if we're if we are really an advanced progressive nation we should be listening to the soviet point of view we should be listening to our point of view we should be exchanging information and hearing each other huh. and that was you know that was what got me labeled a communist um and, and even my father at one point when i opposed the war in vietnam said he felt it was his um his moral obligation to report me to the government as a potential <laughs> communist and i had no you know i had no interest in communism except to know about it uh -huh. <laughs> and uh -huh. so it was like you know and I actually am you know, fairly strong on you know the in initial value of capitalism and then its tendency to to, to, to be uh, to go off into profit making at the expense of other things and therefore the need for checks and balances in government. And as I've come to be, uh, have that same feeling about men and women. That, yeah, you know, that, uh, right. that that men and women, you know, that the way the way the children are raised the best is what I call a checks and balance parenting. Um, mm -hmm. You you um, value what women tend to bring to the parenting table of nurturing and connecting and unconditional love, and you also value the male style of unconditional love, which is boundary enforcement and discipline to a greater degree. And most couples and some couples are the reverse of that. Mm -hmm. And so, but the important thing is that. You know, when the when the mother says something like, you know, sweetie, you can't climb the tree, and the dad says, well, go ahead and climb the tree, um, that the that the that the father and mother understand that the dialogue between the two of them mm. is really what is best for the child, and it doesn't indicate because you disagree that you're ready for divorce. It indicates that you are doing good parenting. Mm -hmm. So hear each other out, and so um, so anyway, um, I I started to. I was teaching at Rutgers University. This is 1974, and um, and the uh, I was doing my doctorate, doctoral dissertation at NYU, and um, the women's movement surface. Uh, actually, I said this is 1974. This is about 1970, mm -hmm. and the women's movement surface. And I just took an interest in it, and I, because I was teaching political science at Rutgers, um, I was able to look at it as a political movement. And um, and the students in my class said, you know, Dr. Farrell, when you or actually at that time it was just Warren Farrell, uh, you know, you have have um, fire in your belly um, when you're talking about the women's movement. You really just love it. And, and um, But so about half of the class of those years was opposed to it, and half the class was for it. So I started setting up um, uh, listening um, things where the, you know, where the people who were for it um, you know, argued um, from their perspective, and the people who were against it argued from their perspective. But I noticed that the debates only reinforced the biases that people had before the debate. So I had everybody in the class reverse roles, and the ones that were for it argued against it and vice versa uh -huh. and the students and then I had them do things like role reversal dates in men's beauty contests where I said uh -huh. every woman is in a beauty contest every day of her life so guys if you want to understand what that feels like um, you know participate in the beauty contest of everyday life that women go through and then you know when all the women were just cheering me and saying yay thank goodness this guy understands what it's like to be focused on uh -huh. as a sex object I said okay now let's reverse roles and got women your turn to ask the guys out uh, that you're most attracted to and focus on the men that won the beauty contest as potentially the ones you're most attracted to. And the women go, oh, well, well, wait a minute here. And then, you know, the, and then they were really fearful of asking out the guys and they ended up feeling like they were jerks at the end of the, an hour's, you know, class or so. And the, um, and so the guys ended up saying, yes, that's the way we feel like we're always having to take initiatives. We have to risk rejection. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we, we act like jerks. And the women were going, yes, I, and, and you get it, my perspective now too, um, which is that you know that here I am. You guys understood now that you were focused on trying to get attention for your body, but then at the end you resented the fact that you were only getting attention for your body. Mm -hmm. And so you know, and so the class was really getting that there were two. You know, there were many points of view on things, and you can't just get points of view by hearing people debate because that tends to attract you to the side that you're already on. Mm -hmm. You have to reverse roles. You have to argue from the other side. You have to emotionally participate in somebody else's perspective. And that's what's led me now, you know, maybe a half century later, mm -hmm. uh, to doing couples communication workshops, which I just finished one this weekend. Um, 
1440 Multiversity, and and do it. At, I'll be doing it in a few weeks at Esalen, which is teaching couples to be able to um, be able to hear personal criticism without becoming defensive. But what it, you know, what we have to understand is that becoming defensive was functional historically because when you heard criticism of yourself, it could be an enemy, and so um, you, your your job was to kill the enemy before the enemy killed you, and so that was very functional for survival. It's just terrible for love. Yeah. <laughs> just, so, just like the Cold War. Just like the Cold War. Just right. like um, you know yeah. the Republicans and Democrats yeah. today. You know yeah, who yeah. could not hear each other. That's you know, right. just listen to the impeachment debates, and you heard you know you heard a perfect example of nobody hearing anything but what they wanted to hear. Exactly. And so it's um, and so um, I began to start you know speaking about these things. But um, at the beginning, um, my um, interest in the women's movement led me to changing my doctoral dissertation topic, which I was only able to change because I was also assistant to the president of NYU, and my, my doctoral dissertation committee was were afraid of objecting to my changing. And so they gave in because they just all thought the women's movement was going to be a fad. And it, is, it was a fad, we'll be a fad, <laughs> and we'll just, just out. And I said, no, yeah. it's going to be part of an evolutionary shift. For, you know, for the first time in history, uh, we have the freedom to be able to have be free of survival as a focus. And um, mm-hmm. and so this was before the belief was that we were dominated by a world of patriarchy in which men made the rules to benefit men at the expense of women. So I didn't have to argue that argument. But what I argue now is that we weren't dominated by a patriarchy. We were dominated by the need to survive. Mm-hmm. And to survive, men in most culture, uh, women in most cultures raised children and men in most cultures raised money or some equivalent of money like killing an animal. And so, the, um, and so it wasn't that our grandparents and great-grandparents, they did not have privilege. Uh, they had responsibility. They had obligations. And, you know, when, when I started to talk to, you know, uh, teach psychology and train psychologists around the world, my father was worried. He said, you can't train people to, to do what they want to do. You have to train people to do what they need to do. Mm-hmm. Um, doing what they want to do will make them weak and not able to do what they need to do. Mm-hmm. And so all these things I started to begin to, fi- you know, find and feel and try to communicate in the culture. And so I was very supportive. You know, I was like, I, I, I think it's fair to say that for a number of years in the 70s, I was the world's leading male feminist and spoke mm-hmm. all around the world on mm-hmm. feminist issues. Sure. And I felt very strongly about that until in the mid 70s, um, I began to, to do research that showed me that children of divorce who do not have a lot of father involvement, uh, those children do very poorly on average, some not, but, uh, and women. So we have here these single mothers who are just feeling overwhelmed. We have single, we have dads who are feeling left out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have children who are doing much worse. Mm-hmm. And so I'm explaining this to the board of directors of the National Organization for Women, which is what I was elected to in uh, about 1970. And they were, and that those were the ones that were recommending me to do 50 to 60 speaking engagements per year. And so I was, you know, er- earning an extremely good living from doing these speaking engagements so, so frequently on the women's movement. And then, but when I brought up to the board of directors of now uh, that I was on, uh, that there was um, that that the, the research is beginning to show that children raised with minimal or no father involvement, those children do not do well uh, on average, and some of them do very well, but it's a, it's the exception rather than the rule, and that the, you know, that there's something happening here, and it, we all we all here uh, at now care a great deal about our children, do we not? And there was sort of a silence. Of course, everybody did, but they felt, but they cared more about something else in the children. They called, they cared more about women's freedom to be able to raise the children the way they thought was best after divorce. They cared about women's freedom to be able to raise children by themselves without being married and having mm. to be tied to a man. Mm. They care. They didn't feel that the family was that important. They felt that women's rights was more important. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I and my response was, women absolutely have to have the right to have children if they want to have children, but the moment they choose to have children, which is their right, and they should have no no freedom um, that should not be uh, taken away from them, but when you make the free choice to have a child, you make the free choice to put your child's interest before your freedom. That's the choice. That's the, that's re, that's the responsibility that comes with that choice. That's the deal. And if your children are not doing well because 
because you want to get a divorce and move to another state with a different man and leave the biological father behind. Um, that seems reasonably okay until you find out that the research shows that those boys especially tend to be feel abandoned and devastated mm-hmm. and don't have a male role model that they really feel is their real, male role model. Mm-hmm. And the uh, and here I was, a stepfather, doing when I was doing this research, and I was wanting to feel that, well, no, wait a minute, you know, a stepfather can be just as good as a biological father, but I couldn't find any research to back up my desire to have that mm-hmm. be true. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I found that... Um, it was that children really are on some level that we're only beginning to understand uh, through epigenetics and other um, <coughs> research that the, that children are um, that, that there is an attachment to the biological father that the, hmm. the and the biological mother too that when a child looks in the mirror and he's what what he or what a boy sees is you know the the, the body language of his dad the eyes the hair of his dad uh, and. Um, and so, if he's being told by the mother in a divorce situation uh, that your dad, that the dad is, um, you know, sort of um, irresponsible, a narcissist, and a liar, um, you know, that boy is going to look in the mirror and wonder, well, well, gee, I'm looking in the mirror. Maybe I'm a narcissist. Um, I did lie. Maybe I'm a liar. Um, and he's going to feel um, the the guilt of of the fear that he's going to be the negative things his dad is portrayed as being. Mm-hmm. But he can't talk to his dad about it, and he can't talk to his mom about. It because if he talks to either one about it, he'll further destabilize a situation that he's already worried about being destabilized. Mm. And so these are some of the you know the the, the disparate thoughts that have <clears throat> led me to sort of saying the women's movement is wonderful for expanding the options of women, um, but demonizing men and saying that all masculinity is toxic and that men have male privilege. Yes, there's a lot of masculinity that's toxic, but it didn't come from male privilege. It came from male sacrifice. The sacrifices we had to make to be disposable, disposable at war and disposable in the workplace yes. uh, that disconnected yes. us from ourselves in order to be able yes. to, pre- to to give women female privilege, yes. to give women the, the female privilege of being able to be home and safe uh, while no man had that privilege in World War I or World War II. Yes. I, <laughs> when I heard you say this in at the Red Pill and elsewhere, I was wiped out because I have been studying these issues and thinking about them very hard for decades, and I, it had never occurred to me <laughs> that men are oppressed in their own ways, mm-hmm. um, that men are the ones who, go to, as you said, who go to war, they're the ones who are drafted, they're the ones who work in coal mines and as lumberjacks, the worst, hardest, most dangerous, mm-hmm. most deadly professions. The problem I had with a lot of other men's right, so-called men's rights movement leaders is that they tend to talk about, I think, as if they've been oppressed by women, that women yes. have imposed these things on men. They sort of flip the script in a way. But you, the thing I liked about you so much is you don't do that, right? You say, let's rather than talk about a matriarchy or a patriarchy forcing each gender into these roles, let's talk about liberating both or everyone from these yes. expectations and these roles, yes. right? I am very, very solidly clear and have been from the very beginning that I'm not in favor of a women's movement um, hating men Mm -hmm. or a men's movement hating women. I'm in favor of a gender liberation movement, freeing both sexes from the rigid roles of the past to more flexible roles for our future. And, you know, uh, as you've heard me say, um, we're all in the same family boat. When only one sex wins, both sexes lose. Mm-hmm. If you have a man that is not growing up to be functional, successful, happy, focused, you have a woman who loses a man who's functional, successful, happy, mm-hmm. focused. Mm-hmm. Women who are heterosexual, who want men to marry and who want to be, uh, want to have a good father, uh, they lose when a man loses. Mm-hmm. Well, that was Warren Farrell 101, everyone. And but where there's much more to say, I want to pause and track back now that we've now that you've laid out many of your core ideas. Go back and in, into your history a little bit more again. So, I, first of all, I didn't know about the Soviet Union thing, and it's, it's a brilliant analogy. You know, this Cold War between these hostile forces, and you were interested in discussion, dialogue, learning mm-hmm. from one another. Mm-hmm. Even if you know you can be you can be f- fully anti-communist as I am, mm-hmm. there are certainly going to be some things you can learn from mm-hmm. the experiences of the Soviet people. At Absolutely, the very least, right? Absolutely. 
Your father uh, apparently was uh, not so keen on that. <laughs> yes, I, he loved me, and he was a wonderful dad. Okay, well, that's and, what I was going to ask he, you. About. He wanted me to be safe in the world, okay. and he knew that in the McCarthy era, speaking up about um, oh, you know, about being open to a communist perspective was not a very functional way to be. So he was just being protective then. I think he was being protective, and then he also believed, and you know, um, he had a very strong belief in capitalism and yep. a very strong okay. uh, belief in the evils of communism. So okay. that was also true. Well, I've never heard. You talk, maybe you have, but I've never heard you really talk about your parents and your childhood, which mm-hmm. I think must be very important here, especially mm-hmm. given your subsequent career. So, your your father was an accountant, is this right? My father was an accountant, okay. correct. And what was he like as a father, and what was your relationship like? He was a good father, um, and it was was a relationship was quite good. I mean, I saw um, him give up being a well when we we lived in europe when i was 14 and 15 as i mentioned mm. and then we um, my mother was very depressed when she was over there because she had no friends mm. and she hated the the amount of rain we we experienced in the netherlands and mm. we lived in the hague in holland and so she wanted to come back here to the united states and my father uh, quit his job as a manager of a company in Holland. And so he was in his late 50s at the time that he did that. And so um, there was not very many companies willing to hire him at that point in time. So he st- sold encyclopedias from door to door. Wow. And, you know, and so he said to me once, you know, it's it's very hard on me to, you know, be a manager of a significant company and now be selling encyclopedias from door to door. I feel like my whole career has led nowhere. Mm. and And yet... When he told me that, and he showed me his vulnerability, I had more respect for him than when he mm-hmm. was when he was the manager of a company because right. I saw that he was willing to do what it took to make sure the that his children were brought up well. Mm. Then he started. Then he was hired by Bendix Corporation, and Bendix offered him a few promotions after they got to know him. Um, but he said, after one or two small promotions, he said, "I don't want to take any more. I want to just have time for the family. I want to have time for freedom, mm-hmm. um, and time for you know time to." To help raise you well. And so he was very conscious about, he required a lot of me. I was the oldest of three children and, you know, anything I did, uh, I, when I was, when I started to speak and I was at my, the height of my fame, he would attend a couple of things that I did. Um, and he would say afterwards, you know, I just want to make it clear. I'm not your fan. I am, I am someone here to help you be, be better to be, mm-hmm. to crit- he, he put it as to criticize you, mm-hmm. but from his perspective, criticizing me was a way of making sure I had zero zero or a few Achilles heels mm. uh, so that I wouldn't be uh, torn apart. And that was hard for a young person, yeah. you know, to because, you know, um, a father like that, you end up wanting to get the approval of. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, I was getting a Ph.D., but he thought I was getting a PhD, so I could be, you know, the, you know, some big cheese like the president of a major university, and so I became the assistant of the president of NYU. And he just saw he was very proud, and he thought I was just going to go, you know, real places. And I saw that, you know, the president of NYU was somebody who just was basically raising money, mm-hmm. and so I didn't want to be spending, you know, my life raising money. I wanted to do something that like what I'm doing now, mm-hmm. but you know, his his attitude was you, you cannot write a book and be success you can't write books and be successful mm-hmm. you know 99 percent of people don't even get their book published True. and the average person who gets their book published at that time only made and this was statistically accurate only five thousand dollars a year right and so he'd point me to you know f scott fitzgerald whose wife whose future wife zelda when they were madly in love made it very clear to him that there's no way shape or form i can marry you until you have a successful first novel mm-hmm. or second novel but you have to be a success before I'm marry, marrying you. So he said, you can't find a publisher. You'll never find a wife. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so, so he was, he was planted a lot of those seeds in my mind. And yet at the same time, I felt this drive to be, uh, I was mentioning to you when we were off uh, script before the, um, about the the founding fathers, and as a political scientist, mm. I studied the Federalist Papers, and these were people who, like Alexander Hamilton and Jefferson, who were both intellectuals and activists. And I always found that when I finished a book, um, like I did with the most recent book I've done is The Boy Crisis, and that's probably the book that's had the most impact on me, mm. because I've seen the degree to which boys are hurting all around the world. And for me, when 
the boys are hurting to that degree and almost no one sees it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do. I feel like I have a moral obligation to go beyond just writing a piece of intellectual explanation that I have a need. It's like writing, um, you know, the preamble to the Constitution, but having nobody see it, that I have a that I have a responsibility, a moral responsibility to go beyond just intellectually thinking. Um, Most of my intellectual friends that got PhDs with me, not a single almost. I don't think a single one of them is a major activist. Hmm. And most of my activist friends don't read very much. And so <laughs> it's sort of like, and I, I feel like the founding fathers, I want to read, I want to think, and but I also feel I want to spend a good part of my life um, helping something happen. And so I'm working now a lot with the White House um, to make sure that the boy crisis is recognized as put out there before the the United States and therefore the world. Mm-hmm. And so uh, even though I'm not, um, I'm more Democrat than I am Republican, um, I, I feel the White House has been, and Republicans in general, have been far more understanding of the importance of a father and of the importance of family. Which has moved you even further away from the <laughs> yes, feminist yes, movement, the, right? Yes, and exactly. And even more of a pariah. Right. Yes, and it's, a, it's very fascinating to be caught between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... The, back to your parents, though. <laughs> well, we'll def- I want to talk about the boy crisis for sure, but I'm curious about the dynamic between them as parents. So I, I grew up in a household in which there was co-parenting. My, both I and my son are children of divorce. Mm-hmm. I, when I was five, my son when he was seven. But there was always co-parenting. And my mm-hmm. mother was a major feminist, by the way, mm-hmm. uh, in the 60s and 70s in the Bay Area and a member of now, I believe, but a member of more sort of radical organizations as well. So I grew up in a feminist household in which it wasn't even questioned that, you know, this is how you raise children where there's everyone works and everyone raises the kids. And that's, that's mm-hmm. the way it is. You said that your father, you know, he had a, a job which took him away from the home. And this is a major theme in your work that, that men sacrifice freedom and power and, but, and time, mm-hmm. especially with their children, which is, which does not benefit anyone. But then he made this sort of conscious decision at a certain point in his career to take more time. Yes. Right. And make, yes. maybe make less money as mm-hmm. a consequence. Right? Oh, definitely make less money. Which right. is better. But I think what you're saying is that, that was a net benefit for you and for him. Yes. Right. And, yes. and you also uh, prescribe that for others. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So what was the dynamic, though, as a child between the two? Was there co-parenting or was he just gone and your mom was raising you? For the most part, my mother was full time a mother, okay. and um, mm-hmm. and my father worked, um, and he. Um, it, we lived in New Jersey, right. and he worked. Uh, went into the city to commute every day. Mm-hmm. So he left about seven in the morning, got back about seven at night, and so even though that was a normal commute and normal mm-hmm. amounts of time, um, when you lived in, uh, we lived in a place called Waldwick, New Jersey, in Bergen County. It was, you know, and that it, those most of the men there. I think probably every man that I knew, except maybe the principal of a local school, um, worked in the, um, you know, went to New York City, mm-hmm. and um, and got, you know, left about seven. And got back about six or seven. Yep. Classic. Uh, yes, classic. Many novels written about that very thing, right? Yes, yes, That's exactly. Right. So, okay, then you became an academic, got a PhD, and then you became involved in the women's liberation movement, as it was called then, and se- or second wave feminism, and now specifically when you're an academic. Then I don't think people quite heard this or know, but you became so famous that you were on national television shows on a regular basis in the early 70s. There's people yes. People can go online and can see this, where you're doing yeah. your... Uh, your role reversal exercise on national was was it the Mike Douglas show? The Mike Douglas show and Al, many others, right? Yes, Alan Alda was Alan Alda, uh, yeah. one of the um, the contestants mm-hmm. in the and the Fifth Dimension, which was a famous singing group at mm-hmm. the time. They were they were also contestants, and then we had Miss USA and Miss Universe, who were the judges. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was a uh, and yes, and I was on. You know, today show all the all the major TV shows um, as frequently as basically I wanted to be, and I wrote for the New York Times and you know all the major um, you know uh, featured in the New York Times, et cetera, et cetera. And you wrote the Liberated Man. I wrote the first book I wrote was the Liberated Man, and it came out in 1974, mm-hmm. and it was basically about the importance of the women's movement, mm-hmm. and um, and it was and it did introduce the term success object. So I mm. I um, at that point in time, I guess it was 1974, said yes, women are treated as sex objects, and men are treating it. Treating as success objects. So that was the introduction within the framework of feminism of the fact that the that the gender roles cut both ways in terms of objectifying both sexes. There's more than one way to be objectified. Yes. And men can su- men do suffer from it just in a different way. Exactly. And I want to give Betty Friedan credit here, yeah. uh, too, because Betty Friedan wrote a book, not just The Feminine Mystique, but she also wrote a book called The Second Stage. Huh. And this evolved out of many discussions between Betty Friedan and I about 
you know, the, the fact that gender roles were very, um, you know, that they restricted and constrained both sexes. And Betty got that. Mm. And um, and it was not just me who introduced that to her. Mm. She had this own her own propensity uh, toward understanding that as well. And so in the second stage, she basically said, um, feminism will plateau and women will not be able to be equal representatives in the workplace unless men are equal representatives at home. Mm -hmm. And Gloria right. Steinem also understood that. And, you know, Gloria put it in slightly different terms, which is that what we need is more women in the place of, in, in, at, at, in work and we need more men at home. And so both of them were it had some understanding of, but especially Betty Friedan, of the, of the fact that gender roles restricted both sexes. This was not a plot by men against women. Mm -hmm. This was the, a way of restricting both sexes. Now, radical feminists didn't get that. They mm -hmm. felt that the family, the nuclear family, b based on you know, Lenin, was designed to oppress women and benefit men. But Betty Friedan especially got that. Betty Friedan was a terrible human being to many women in particular. Mm -hmm. She was a male chauvinist mm -hmm. in many ways, mm -hmm. ironically. <laughs> yeah, I'm not um, a fan. <laughs> yes, and, but she really had a vision that was much fairer. Whereas Gloria Steinem um, did have, they, she saw men and the patriarchy more as being the enemy, uh -huh. um, at least some men as being the enemy, men, men that didn't agree with the feminist perspective as being the enemy, and but she was one of the finest human and, beings you'll ever meet. And you, Okay, well, mm -hmm. actually, well, but she did something to you that's not so fine, but that, you know why that is about Betty Friedan? It's because she was a communist. Oh, is it? yeah, right? that is true. She was the idea very, about the equality of sexes. I mean, yeah. so the whole argument, the thrust of the feminine mystique published in the early 60s, 61, 62, um, 63, 63. Right. Okay. Is uh, that women should enter the workforce. Mm -hmm. and, and that was really the, that's the main argument there. Yes. That women should get out of the home and mm -hmm. get into the workforce mm -hmm. in positions of economic power. So it makes sense to me that, that she would see it in sort of class terms yes. right? and uh, yes. that the idea would be for women and men to be equal in the workforce and mm -hmm. equal at home. Right? Yes, that's, a yes. very, that's actually sort of a Soviet idea, as a yes, matter of fact. Right? Yes. And Gloria Steinem does not come from that background. Yes. For people who don't know, Betty Friedan was, I believe, an actual member, or at least a fellow traveler of the Communist Party before she was famous as a feminist. So you had a great relationship with these women, these leaders, these, these iconic leaders of the women's liberation movement, Steinem and Friedan, uh, for a time. And they, you were sort of their star in, in, mm -hmm. in many ways, their male star. I was the one that helped prove that if Warren Farrell is out there speaking in favor of feminism, then the women's movement cannot be all a hate, hate, hating yeah. men, men of men movement. So you just right? proved that stereo, the yes. stereotype. Or, the, I, the, you know, it's a token. The of token the man hating feminist. Yes, right, yes, yeah, exactly. exactly. But then you were read out of the movement. Yes. We, because you started to make an argument about child custody. Is this right? This That's was the right. main sticking yes. point? Yes. Or the main breaking yes. point, when, I should yes, say? Yes, when I, when I made it clear that the early research in the 70s was showing already that children who were raised without a, um, a father involvement didn't do as well as children who were raised with father involvement. And that was true for both girls and boys, but especially true for boys. The feminists, in, you know, they said, well, wait a minute, you know, we, <coughs> we, we are afraid of, of, uh, of losing now members who want to be able, after divorce, to do what they wish to do, to leave their old life of a bad decision with a man that they don't feel was right for them mm -hmm. and start a new life. We don't want to inhibit that. And if we do inhibit that, they were getting letters to prove that the, that those um, the, uh, from feminists who are now members saying, if you're going to not, if you're going to say children should have equal rights, to, uh, dads should have equal yeah. rights to the children and children should have equal rights to the dads, right. then we're not going to be a now member anymore. Yeah. And they said, we have more fish to to fry than just custody. We have yes. lots of equality issues to fry, and we have to worry about our, you know, our political support being strong. Yeah. And I understood that from a political perspective, but I said that's not, you can't trade off the next generation for a political advantage. Right. Um, otherwise, you're going to really undermine your long term integrity. And so that's, and so they responded by basically saying, well, you know, we, we, um, why don't you go ahead and do more research? You said yourself that the research wasn't really uh, long, longitudinal and it wasn't really complete and the, the ends, the numbers were small. So, but I could see in the, in the eyes of everybody, it was like, if your new research finds that children really need their dads as much as their moms, mm -hmm. you can't expect to be getting the 50 speaking engagement referrals um, per year for, from us and your career will basically fall apart. And, and let's be clear, am I right? Now's position on 
custody was they were against officially, I believe, against men, uh, divorced men's custody rights. Yes, they were against the rights of a divorced men to have custody rights over children at all. That's right. And they're That's just and, when I found that out, I, I was blown away. And this is in the early 70s. And, yeah. and the reason for that, even to this day, <sighs> is that when a woman doesn't, you don't want to put women in the position where a man who's engaged in domestic violence um, will mm-hmm. have to be equally involved with the, with the children. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a valuable, you know, there's a valid argument sure. to that. Sure. But the truth is that as we, as we have known about domestic violence for since the ni- mid 1970s, is that every single major study on domestic violence uh, that is on domestic violence issues um, shows that that men and women who are married or living together abuse each other physically about equally, hmm. and to to this day, hmm. we cannot get um, we cannot get legislation, and I cannot even. Uh, and the, while the White House agrees with me that domestic violence is a two way street, and that the best thing we could do for it is to teach good communication skills so that people know how to hear each other, so they don't get angry um, at each other and hit each end up hitting each other, which men and women do about equally. Mm-hmm. Um, that that would be the best solution, prevention of, of good communication. They cannot get that past the feminists who say that once a man hits a woman, he should not be given a second chance. Mm-hmm. I had this conversation with the person who was the head of the Department of Justice's um, section on the on domestic violence until just recently, really? when she's now the assistant attorney. Um, she's the deputy principal deputy assistant attorney general. And she's been, she got very frustrated that she could not get, even though she's a conservative and she's part of the Trump administration, she could not get past the feminist barriers on that. Mm, I bet. I bet. It'll take a while. The new Renegade University has new courses on the history of race in America, the politics of sex work with Maggie McNeil, an introduction to Nietzsche with Daniel Coffeen, and my new What is Postmodernism course. We also have a large catalog of courses featuring my Renegade History of the United States series, Scott Horton's courses on American foreign policy, and my histories of the United States in the 19th century and of World War II. We're also about to release two brand new courses, The History of Martial Arts with Daniele Bolelli and An Instructional Design for Dying with Tom Nickel. But what makes Renegade University fundamentally different than all other online universities and even most brick and mortar universities is that you get to talk one-on-one with us, the instructors, via what we call office hours. Students and members of RU also can talk to each other on our very own social media platform, which is completely free of censors from Facebook or Twitter or the government. At Renegade University, you can say exactly what you want to say. So join us, become a member, go to renegadeuniversity.com. And right now, for a limited time, we are offering 30 to 40% off everything at the brand new RU as part of our grand launch sale. So join the revolution and go to renegadeuniversity.com. So here's my problem with all of this, with second wave feminism. Well, I have many problems, but in terms of what it means, what it has meant in my life, it has meant a whole lot of work. So what we now are expected to do as good feminists, men and women, is to work and raise children. (laughs) Instead of my mother, who's I told you a staunch lifelong feminist, even once admitted to me, she said this, she said, you know, that old division of labor, not a bad idea. A lot less work involved. So I have had to have a career and raise my child as much as my ex-wife has. Yes. It's exhausting. There was no time Indeed. left to watch TV. <laughs> uh, right? I mean, do you do you feel that that's kind of the maybe the fatal flaw or a flaw in that well, model? Well, yes. I, th- I think that any time you take people who have a multitude of personality propensities Mm. and you put straight jackets of what they're supposed to do Mm. on any of them, you, you minimize the potential human contribution. I am by nature a sort of soft listening, nurturing oriented person. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it is, uh, uh, and I also have strong purpose, um, strong intellectual interests and strong active interests for me, uh, a balancing act of raising children and raising money is, uh, is the right thing. But for, for some men, 
being elementary school teachers and and or taking off full time and raising children is more the right thing. Mm -hmm. And for other men okay. going out and being the Marines and being the firefighters that we for sure need is the right thing and the same parallel for women. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the beautiful thing that we have, and this is really important for almost all of history, men did not have freedom. They were any more than women did. Thank you. That um, children were brought up. Every generation had its war. And every, every parent pointed to their, their uncle who was in the Marines as the hero that was on the top of the, of the credenza. And the boy looked up and, and, and got the message that when you grow up, if there is a war and you're needed to fight off, the, uh, so we don't have to speak German, mm -hmm. the German as Nazis, not so much the German, but as the Nazis, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that, you're, that you have a role to play. And your role was when you're 17, 18, to be willing to be disposable. Mm -hmm. And if you're disposable, and you're killed, we'll call you a hero and we'll respect you and we'll talk nice. This will be your le about you for the rest of your um, dead years. Okay. And so, and, and if you, and, and when you come back from that war, we need firefighters, we need men in hazardous jobs. And so 99%, 97% of the people in hazardous jobs are males and 93% mm -hmm. of the deaths in hazardous jobs are uh, by males. Still. Still. Yes. 93% is Incredible. the most re yes. uh, recent figure. Totally ignored by and, feminists. And, uh, totally ignored by <laughs> <laughs> and so the now so for the first time in history so in the old days men learned that their purpose as a male was to be disposable at war or disposable at work and if you were willing to be disposable you'd be lionized and be a hero today though we need fewer men in the in war and we need fewer men to be disposable at work because women are sharing more of the responsibilities for that. So the good news is that men have a freedom today to be able to have multiple potential purposes that are more in, aligned mm -hmm. with their personality. But the problem is that the men who go from a purpose void to a dad void don't usually get the discipline and the boundary enforcement and the male role model to have them explore their inner personality and to achieve whatever purpose they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. So if you so as a rule, if you're a boy and you're a you know loving, caring boy and maybe you're artist you're artistic in orientation and let's say you're a very good at music. Um, almost always a good mother will encourage her boy to take music lessons and to sing and to join the choir and things like that. But oftentimes if that boy is very nourished but not disciplined, he has the, the soul to try out but the, not the discipline to be outstanding in his field. It's often the dad that is more likely to say, you know, you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. And the meaning of the end, and the mom will also say that, by the way, but when the child tries to have as few peas as possible in order to eat their ice cream, the mother's and father's response is often different. The mother can often be manipulated by the boy having a bad day yes. and wanting to have fewer peas in order to have the ice cream. Yes. The fa And the father, because the mother is empathy often comes out mm -hmm. the father will much more likely say um, excuse me we have a deal here the deal here is you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas yep. oh dad you're so mean you can continue whining and crying there'll be no ice cream tomorrow night either and eventually the boy learns to focus on doing what she or he but what he needs to do which is to finish the peas before she or he gets the ice cream and with the mother the boy learns to be to that he or she doesn't have the boy learns to be able, the best way to be coercive to be manipulative to get a better deal with fewer peas before she or he eats the ice cream the important findings that result from this is that the boy raised primarily by dads only 15 percent have adhd the boys raised predominantly by moms, 30% do. Mm. One of the reasons for that difference mm. is because the mm. boys raised predominantly by dads know they don't have a choice but to pay attention to doing what they need to do, finishing those peas, so they don't develop attention deficit disorder. Okay. Um, whereas the, the girls, the boys raised predominantly by moms do not learn that as much. Okay. Now, uh, as much of a liberated man as I have been yes. and as much of a feminist co-parent as I was, I was, in fact, the heavy yes. In, yes. The, in, the, in the relationship with my son. So mm -hmm. when we were still married, my wife at the time 
this is exact. You just described our household really mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. much. It was she would get locked in these sort of endless quibbling arguments with him to try to get him to do things mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. would never resolve. Yes. He would he would sort of get his way, and then yeah. I would wait and wait and wait, and finally I would step in and be the brick wall and mm-hmm. say no. You have to go to bed. No, you have to brush your teeth. And if yeah. you don't brush your teeth, I will brush them for you. Yeah. Now, I also have uh, a lot of lesbian friends. Let me just stop you there for just sure. one second. And this is, uh, um, this is very important to the listening sure. audience. So the frustration for moms on this is when dads behave like you're talking about, moms often say, wait a minute, this is so unfair. He says something once. That's right. And, it's so easy and for him. It's so easy for mm-hmm. him. Yes, exactly. And maybe it's the, the male tone of voice. Why, you know, why is this happening? And so she, she sees all the love she puts into the child, but doesn't realize that the repetition begets repetition begets repetition. Mm-hmm. And she becomes frustrated. And the child knows on some intuitive level that she, she or he has more energy than the mother. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, So this is not a win situation for the the mother or the child, and it's certainly not for the father. Um, but the, but and the, but one of the main reasons that children do not do as well when they don't have a father involvement is because what you are teaching that boy is this is the end of manipulation right. and the beginning of doing what you need to do in order to get what you want to have. Right. And if you don't do it, that's not a problem, but you won't get what you want. And there's 150 things that I'm doing for you mm-hmm. that you will soon find out I'm doing for you if you want to if you want to play with me right. on that issue. Gotcha. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. But I want to begin. And I want to, to I wanna yes. let let the world know that I have lesbian friends. Number one. Yes, <laughs> that's how <laughs> rated I am. No, but my point was that they have children. Right? Yes, and I yes. know a lot of lesbian. We all do now these days. A lot of lesbian couples with children yes. who would be very cross with you for what you just said. Mm-hmm. Um, you are not veering into gender essentialism, are you, Warren? Are you suggesting that men and are biologically predisposed to be that way, and women are predisposed to be their way? Yeah, I'm saying that that biologically, the oh. average man is more disposed to be one way okay. than the average woman is, but. I am also saying uh, that there are many times where the women are more the um, the, the boundary enforcer, okay. and the man is um, can especially with a daughter um, can have that little daughter tie him around his fingers okay, and, and become very um, okay. you know, not what, to, whether or not it's to, biological. Mm-hmm. We can have a separate argument yeah, sure. about that, but you are saying it is perfectly possible mm-hmm. for a lesbian couple to replicate the the kind of healthy uh, relationship that you're talking about. The, yes, okay. there's there's about nine different parenting relationships. Yes, yeah. there's about nine differences that I talk about in the boy oh. crisis between dad style parenting and mom style okay, parenting. Right. Yeah. Statistically speaking, these are true, but the but on but most of these differences, if not all of them, can be learned by either sex. So um, it is so, but but it takes a lot. The average woman does not easily enforce those boundaries and um, and 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 uh, not allow an argument or empathy to to overcome them just like with your wife mm-hmm. and the average man is more likely to be prone in your direction but the average man the father who feels unvalued for his contribution mm. soon starts making on average more focus on um, his, the workplace because that's where he does get uh, rewarded by his wife, mm-hmm. and so he drops out of the he may drop out of the parenting process, and the children as a result of that will suffer. So one of the purposes of the boy crisis book is to communicate to men that here is the value of your of the of what is more likely to be your natural propensity as a dad Mm -hmm. and 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 women cannot hear what you don't say so you as a father need to understand that when you roughhouse it isn't just about a roughhousing and being one more child that the mom has to monitor Mm -hmm. that roughhousing combined with boundary enforcement creates three major important outcomes it creates empathy and you mm. and so almost no mother or father understands how could roughhousing lead yeah. to empathy? And can you explain uh, that? Yes, yeah, sure. I'm surprised by that too. Yes, yeah, sure. The um, so that so let's say the dad takes the the three kids and throws them on the couch and the three kids and the, and says, "All right, the game is the three of you have to pin me down before I pin all three of you down together." Mm-hmm. Okay, you got it. Oh yeah, Dad, we got it. And so the kids, you know, jump on dad and but in the process they experience what psychologists call emotional intelligence under fire. Uh, the, huh. And so let's say de, um, big brother sticks his uh, elbow in little sister's face and 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 the, and then little sister starts crying and you know mom is sitting here thinking, "Oh my God." 
realize sooner or later somebody's going to start crying. She's about 100% likely to be right. Mm -hmm. And so so eventually one of the kids starts crying. And dad usually will say some version of, um, excuse me, you know, you can't, it's nice that you tried to win in, in the in the wrestling, but you cannot stick your uh, your elbow in your sister's face. Um, and so the child is now beginning to hear that someone else's mm-hmm. needs matter, mm-hmm. but that doesn't work yet. It's um, so it's, as they continue, and the child the, the father gives the children another chance. Uh, the fa- the um, then the same behavior happens again in some slightly different form, and the father goes, "Now you are being aggressive. You're not being assertive. Here's what being assertive looks mm-hmm. like. Oh, you know, okay, I I, I I didn't stick my elbow in the in my sister's face, but I just pushed her over on the floor. Uh, that's being aggressive. Okay, so mom may say the same thing, but dad is now giving." the children an experience of what um, being unempathetic is Mm -hmm. and what being aggressive is. Mm -hmm. And so, but here's where it really counts. Then the father says, you do that one more time and there'll be no more roughhousing. And mom's going, twice they've cried and you haven't learned your lesson. You're still roughhousing. But it's the next time that counts because when one of the children is too aggressive or makes the daughter or or other brother cry, then the father usually stops the roughhousing and says, okay, you broke the rules. There's no more um, roughhousing till tomorrow night. Um, and so it was the tomorrow night, the first tomorrow night when the children broke the rules after being warned that teaches the children that it's if they're going to get what they want, which is roughhousing, they need to be empathetic to their sister's or brother's needs. Mm-hmm. They need to know what's assertive, not aggressive, and most important, they need to postpone gratification. Immediate gratification is pushing your brother or sister out of the way to win roughhousing. Yep. Postpone gratification is you can't do that to win what you want if you want to get what you want. Roughhousing is not just a melee. It's a game. And a game has rules. Yes. Or a sport, right? Yes, you're, exactly. The way you're talking about it, it sounds mm-hmm. to me like a sport. Mm-hmm. And, of course, men generally have been historically you know, involved in sports more than women. This mm-hmm. is very much changing now, but historically certainly thank, have. And it sounds to me like a, a coach, mm-hmm. you know, teaching teaching an athlete what the limits are, what they can and cannot do. What, right. in, in football, in boxing, and mixed martial arts, whatever it is, mm-hmm. there are limits even yes. there, right? Yes, absolutely. And that is, um, it's crucial because the sport doesn't continue. Uh, if people don't follow those rules, Precisely. roughhousing will not happen if you don't follow these rules, these right. boundaries. Right, exactly. So it helps. I understand now that it helps yes. children learn that to follow for certain boundaries, you can do the things that are fun in life right. and fulfilling. And here's why it's not women's fault. Okay. Because men don't read about these things, but mm-hmm. it's also not men's fault because I've never seen a parenting magazine explain this to mm-hmm. anybody. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, one of the reasons I focused uh, part of the Boy Crisis book on these nine differences is because I had not seen any book or instructions to parents about what, you know, to help them understand the value of roughhousing, its connection by its connection statistically to empathy, its connection to being assertive and not aggressive, and that and that once somebody is assertive and empathetic, um, but not aggressive, they are far more likely to have more friends. They're far more less likely to become depressed. They're far less likely to withdraw. They're far less likely to withdraw into video game addiction. They're far more likely to be attractive if they're boys to females, because because a with the postponed gratification, they know how to achieve achieve Mm -hmm. the things that they need to achieve. Women date winners. They don't date losers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Women don't look for uh, men in the unemployment lines um, who are uh, sleeping in their parents' basement uh, for future fathers. Um, You know, Mm -hmm. uh, know, Lois Lane was not interested in Clark Kent at all. It wasn't until he became Superman that she was interested in him. (laughs) And so the the point of all that is that there's a, a need uh, for us to understand that th- that on average, most men have unwitting ways as fathers of doing things that they don't even understand why they're doing. Women are not to blame because women can't hear what men don't say. And men are not to blame because they have learned to get loved largely by earning money, not by uh, raising children. Mm-hmm. They, even if it was in parenting magazines, many fathers don't read them very much. And so, but, but, but it isn't in parenting magazines either. Mm-hmm. So neither sex is to blame. 
claim both sexes need to learn the value of dad being a checks and balance parenting that is equally involved in the parenting process if we want our children to do well. And I don't believe there's a parent that I've ever met that doesn't want their children to do well. Okay, but you also you also allow that a woman could be could serve, could serve that function yeah, not of, only, of, of the of the father. Right. In that sense. Not okay. do I, not only do I allow for that, yep. but I give some really concrete examples where that has happened. Right. So, uh, Urban Dove, for example, of a school in New York, hmm. Brooklyn, and, oh, yeah. and Bedford Stuy huh. uh, in New York, um, uh, uh, hires both female and male teachers for young boys who are not doing uh, boys and girls who have are, are in jeopardy of dropping out of, of of junior high school and so on, and those male and female teachers. The first three hours, three hours of school, they they focus on coaching the children in physical activities. Mm. Both female and male teachers do this. And the female and male teachers do sort of roughhousing and engaging in multiple sports and activities. And then, unlike most coaches who continue just coaching more, those female and male teachers stop the coaching and follow, uh, go around and check into classrooms to see if any boy or girl is having trouble. And if they're having trouble in math, they take their their credibility as a coach, helping them to win against the adversary, um, is transferred to helping them win in the uh, against that math problem. The, the the math problem is treated as the opponent, and you're treated as the person who can who, who can get to do what you did in with with the team sport. Mm-hmm. And so both females and males do this. There's very few behaviors that uh, that males do that females can't learn, and there's very few behaviors that males do that. The females can't learn. Amen. Uh, you are you stand for gender liberation. Yes, exactly. Which you might even say you you stand you are a gender abolitionist, perhaps. That's why I've that? never I've never thought of the word, but yes, I'm. Yes, I, let's see. I guess I'm a gender liberationist more than an abolitionist because if you want, uh, I, I believe in the personal freedom that if if you grow up and you're more of a firefighter type of male and that's your deep in your personality, mm-hmm. um, then. Um, part of liberation is freeing you to be that. I'm not going to abolish your desire, your propensity sure. uh, to be that. Um, but um, also, I want it to be your choice, yeah, yeah. not because your father or grandfather was a firefighter, and that's the way you knew um, you, you would get approval. Yeah. One of the things I talk about a lot in the Boy Crisis book is social bribes. Hmm. Um, mm. the, that that, you know, that when we call the boy a hero... Mm. Um, we're mm. giving him a social bribe to be willing to be disposable. Indeed, great. Yes. Wow. That's that's I think the most one of the most liberating ideas of yours for me personally is know, a social I, bribe. Yes, I, that I, idea. Thank you. Well, the whole idea that you know we are as men, you know, we are expected to do these things that are awful often for many mm-hmm. of us that we don't want to do. We hate doing, you know, a lot of boys hate football. <laughs> a, yeah. lot of, a lot of, thank God, most of us don't want to go to war, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. We don't yeah. want to die for in Vietnam for mm-hmm. no apparent reason, mm-hmm. or even in, even in Germany in the mm-hmm. 1940s for that matter. Yeah, it's very, very liberating. And I really mm-hmm. appreciate that, that, you. that contribution you made of, among many. This reminds me of, I think it's your third book, The Myth of Male Power in 93 um, or maybe. That sounds about right. About right. About, yeah, so, about which kind of, this was... Um, really broke the back of whatever remaining relationship you had with feminism. The feminist <laughs> yes, movement, yeah, right? Was yes, this exactly. it? Yeah, this is when they really threw yeah. you out yes, entirely. Why, why men are the way they are, the uh, the, he, the head of Ms. Magazine. They um, liked that, didn't they? The, no, no. Oh, the, they didn't no. like that? Oh, but Oprah the, the, liked the, the liberated man, they loved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Oprah loved why men are the way they are. She did say oh. it, it was the first time she really understood men. Oh. And she had me on her show repeatedly. Uh-huh. And that was one of the reasons why men are the way they are became my best-selling book. Um, but the feminists, many feminists did so at that time, there was a gap between Oprah and the feminist community. And now more, Oprah is more in, I mean, she was still feminist in her orientation. Mm-hmm. And part of her feminism was from having some very bad experiences with males when mm-hmm. she was younger. Mm-hmm. But the why men are the way they are sort of like opened up her heart to men. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she was very kind to me when I'd be on her show and somebody would interrupt from the audience. She would like put her put her arms in front of the um, of, of those of that person. And like it was like, 
Moses opening up the sea for me yeah. to walk yes, through. She is. Yes. <laughs> and oh wow. So, okay. So, uh, but um, the, so but the head of Ms. Magazine hmm. uh, said, Warren, you're a naughty boy. Having written this book, she literally called me a naughty boy oh, because I, t- I I analyzed all of Ms. Magazine's advertising and the mentions of men, mm. and and showed that every single mention of men was either negative mm. or as a future res- a source of money so that they would do um, mm. um, De Beers diamond ads and show that you know that, that you know the importance of the thought the man buying a diamond that had the right size the right carrots the right clarity and then I calculated that that man would need to earn one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year in order to do that mm-hmm. and that that's the you know, that, that's the type of success object that the um, oh women God. were directing these uh, so it's this combination uh, of misandry to use that term uh, yes yeah, yeah. Yes. misandry and an expectation that we earn a lot of money for that's, them. that's right exactly so the the man the man is basically just lovable as a wallet and if he doesn't you know and mm-hmm. otherwise all the things we say about him are negative we trash him yes trash him and so i basically broke down every ad that they had uh, for years and and that they, that's why they said i was a naughty, quick, quick, naughty boy quick aside <laughs> maybe this is not an aside but i have been absolutely struck and disgusted and horrified and, and enraged frankly over recent years at what i find to be I think it's a rise in what I would call casual sexism toward men. Mm. It is, I have found it to be perfectly acceptable for women, mostly of the middle and upper classes, Mm -hmm. mostly the educated classes, Mm -hmm. to say things that are definitionally sexist about men and not only get away with it, but be celebrated for it and even get a high five, high five from their sisters for it. Oh, absolutely. I I, I have been the subject of this, you know, especially Mm -hmm. in college campuses. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever been a victim of sexism outside of a college campus. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't ever feel that at all, but on college campuses. Oh yeah. It's, it's common. And I've been denied jobs and I've been told that I wasn't getting the job simply because I was a man. Yes. yes. Uh, And I've had, you know, many comments about, Oh, you're going to watch football this weekend because that's what men do. Or, you know, though you're talking like, Oh, you're sitting that way in that chair because that's, that's what men do. Mm -hmm. Disparaging sexist remarks that are completely acceptable. And Mm -hmm. even as I said, celebrated as sort of, you know, standing up against the patriarchy. Yes. Yes. I, I I know. And no, I I feel like, I feel like I'm the only person who notices this and calls Mm -hmm. it out Mm -hmm. publicly, but I guess you would too. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I notice it completely. And, and I, but no one else seems to. And I 100% agree with you. I mean, and you know, women's studies 101 Mm -hmm. is based Basically, the um, and the sentence that I'm going to say right now, there, I don't think there's a single women's studies professor that would disagree with what I'm saying, but I will completely disagree with it. But the what they, is is that we live in a world dominated by a patriarchy in which men have made the rules to benefit men at the expense of women. Yep. And what I'm saying is, as I said before, we live in a world dominated by the need to survive, in which both men and women were restricted to roles that straightjacketed them, uh, women to 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 raise um, children, no matter what their personality was and men to raise money no matter what their personality was Mm -hmm. and like many feminists i would agree that many women are more suited to um, raising money and many men are more suited to raising children Mm -hmm. and in fact you know that that women without children um, get promoted more quickly in the major corporations than their male counterparts do Um, and the um, and men uh, when children are left to be raised predominantly by dads and the mothers in an intact family me that demographic of children does better than any other demographic that I can um, have, have run across okay. and so that the, you know that that deviate that the people those that that percentage of people that want to be hard-working CEO women those are usually women that are exceptionally good at that and conversely with men as fathers those are men who are usually exceptionally um, good at that mm-hmm. um, but the society in the last um, 50 years has made far more progress uh, freeing women to be in the workplace than oh, they are freeing men staggering. to be um, in the home I mean a, a man knows if he's been a dad and he's been a product of a divorce that the woman has uh, that that in the legal system the woman has the right to the children and the man has to fight for the children Mm -hmm. and i have i do a lot of expert witness work around the country and the average father that calls me has already spent a hundred thousand dollars to be equally involved with his children he uh, not i should never have had to make a single penny off of being an expert witness to say what is absolutely obvious which is that children because i say obvious because the data has been out there 
for 30, 40 years that children do best when they have an equal amount of time. When, well, let me be really practical here. There is, if, if you are listening and you have your, and your children are a product of divorce, there's four things that are what I call four must do's. Mm -hmm. And these four must do's are the children need an equal amount of time with mother and father. Obviously, this is not applicable if one parent is totally abusive and, mm -hmm. you know, so on. But under normal circumstances, um, and they need number one is equal amount of time with mother and father. Number two is that dad and mom do not live more than 20 minutes drive time from each other so that the children don't resent the parents' um, home that they need to go to because they have to miss their soccer practice mm -hmm. or their best friend's birthday party. Number three, that the child is not able to identify or hear any bad mouthing from mother to father or ne um, father to mother or even negative body language mm -hmm. toward the other, uh, about the other parent. And number four is that the children um, be able to have about, uh, uh, sorry, that the parents have um, a consistent communication counseling or relationship counseling mm. at least once a month. Mm. Um, and so all these are four, pro if, so if you're giving your, if you're divorced and you're giving children all four of those, equal parenting, close, cl living close, no bad mouthing and uh, equal amount of uh, um, uh, counseling, your, your children are on average likely to do almost as well as they did would in an intact family. I and my ex-wife did about 85% of that. Mm. I, but I, I endorse all of that. The couples counseling thing, that's a hard one to take, especially if it's an acrimonious divorce. But um, but yeah, I think, I mean, it would be good. Mm -hmm. I think it can't, couldn't hurt. Yeah, especially I, if it's an acrimonious divorce, it's yeah. an important thing to, yeah, I to, guess so. to do. But yes. I certainly endorse the first three um, yes. wholeheartedly. And we certainly tried to do that ourselves before I even heard about you. Oh, I, I wanted to ask you about this. So I, um, I think a huge part of the problem here is the nuclear family itself that structure, that expectation that we should all live in nuclear families. Mm -hmm. I think it's a terrible idea. In fact, I think, you know, the idea is you live on an Island, you're supposed to raise these children all by yourselves. They're just the two of you mm -hmm. raise, you know, raise the money and raise the children and keep the home together. I, I find to be virtually impossible. I think the extended family model, uh, or the mixed family model, whatever you want to call it, blended mm -hmm. family is, is far better, I think for children and for parents. Do you mm -hmm. agree at all on that? Uh, yes and no. Okay. Um, the, so I think it, the father and mother, the children that do best are ones that are raised uh, with a significant amount of input from both mom and dad. Okay. Um, and so that does happen more in the nuclear family than, say, um, than when, when a family, when, it, when a couple's not married. So um, marriage per se, I'm, I'm politically liberal, is not... Well, I'm thinking more of like immigrant families, right? Yes. Other country, and just, or just people in other countries, right, where the nuclear family is sort of rare, where, you mm -hmm. know, I'm thinking of Mexicans, for instance, yes. a lot of Mexican immigrants. Yes. Um, I had a guest on the show, Gustavo Arellano, who talked about growing up in the barrio in Irvine, California. Yes. And it was not just mom and dad, it was mom and dad and uncles and aunts and neighbors and friends. And yes. he was he was raised by dozens yes. of adults yes. who all knew him in the neighborhood. And he said it was it was glorious. And also that it was much better, of course, for his own parents who just had some less work to do. Yes, yes. That does not, does that no, sound no, right that, to you? That, okay. Yes, that does. And okay. and here's the problem. Okay. Not, not that it's a problem with what that is, mm -hmm. but as people, so when you are raised in the type of family that your that, that your friend is describing, mm -hmm. when the new person is born, they'll often say, "Okay, we need a doctor in this, you know, this group. We need a accountant in this group." And we, you start beginning to sort of see what this extended family needs. Mm -hmm. But the more people are successful, the more they ch tend to move away from those areas. So your most successful kids, you know, I grew up in New Jersey, as you know, and you know the the people in that in New Jersey, who are most successful are mostly living in California now. And so that you tend to move mm. farther and farther away because, because as you are raised successfully and, 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 and survival is no longer the issue that people tend to move, to take, to, you, migrate. to, to, to migrate, to have mm. freedom, um, to go to, to different places. In fact, even the migrants, uh, the immigrants rather that come here from Mexico, um, you know, the, the ones that are earning the money here to be able to send back to their family, mm -hmm. they are nevertheless away from mm -hmm. that immediate extended family earning money to um, to support the extended family, and so that's that's why it that's why that that which you describe, which is of great value, 
tends to break apart. Mm. So in the boy crisis exists, for example, in all of the world's developed nations, the 56 largest developed nations, um, when they the children do the PISA tests, which is the international um, evaluations of how well they're doing in, um, in, in their in scholastic areas, um, the boys do worse than girls in all 56 of the large develop, largest developed nations in most areas of academic achievement, especially in reading and writing, which are the two biggest predictors of success. Now, why developed nations? In developed nations, there's more permission for divorce. Mm. In developed nations, there's more permission for p- children to be raised without uh, being married. And the, imp- the importance of being raised without being married is that the average family uh, woman that has a child without being married, but has a, even the ones that have fathers living with them at the time, that father involvement remains uh, an average of about four years. And then the children see minimal or no uh, father after that period of time on average. Okay. So, the, so the success leads to freedom that leads to people breaking up the extended family uh-huh. and that's that's the because the the freedom uh, trumps um, you know, you, um, the and leads people to want to explore to even greater and better opportunities. One of the reasons why immigrants often this country does so well mm-hmm. as a nation of immigrants is because the people who left are often the most adventurous and people, mm-hmm. the most confident people, the most competent competent people. And a nation of immigrants is not a nation of incompetence; it's actually a nation of s- self selected competence. Right. <laughs> you know, you, I mean? when you go to the White House, can you mention that? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Um, okay. I wait, wait, hold on. Hold on there, though. Uh, permission to divorce. I mean, you're not. You don't want to deny that, do you? Oh, I do not want to oh, deny permission good. to divorce. I would so be very I, cross with don't, you. No, no. <laughs> okay. We. Um, I, okay. I. I want freedom. Yeah. Uh, I want permission Great. to divorce. Which, but we have to understand that. So one. But my answer to that, and I am discussing this answer with the White House, mm-hmm. um, is to create. Um, is to teach children how to communicate when they're in first, second, third grade in an elementary school, mm-hmm. and having parenting communication classes for everyone. It can be co-sponsored by your faith-based agency, which is more okay. compatible for conservatives. Um, but it's. Um, but every parent. You know, the reason I teach couples communication cl- classes around the country is because the the Achilles heel of all human beings is our inability to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. Mm, you think so? Yes. That's and, it, huh? That's the uh, one. That's the single biggest Achilles heel. Huh. And Could when be. when you're when you have something to say that you're hurting about or upset about and you don't feel safe to s- share that with your partner, you start keeping it to yourself. And that makes you feel unheard and unloved and um, and that begins to create an emotional divorce. You may you may decide to be legally married because you're raising their children and you want to be responsible. But oftentimes that legal marriage is also coupled with a psychological divorce. Mm -hmm. And when children comes, it often means what I call a minimum security prison marriage Mm -hmm. that many couples are in just because they don't want to break up. Mm -hmm. And so I'm 100% in favor of freedom to divorce, but I'm also more in favor of training us to be able to communicate with each other effectively enough so that we don't have to feel a need to divorce in order to have our own personal uh, viability. We're good now. Great. I like it. Okay. Back to your divorce from the feminist movement. So in 1993, you published the book, The Myth of Male Power. And as I said, this was this was really finalizing your divorce from the, the formal feminist movement, I guess, the institutional mm-hmm. feminist movement. They did not like this book at all. I happen to think it is... It's my favorite of all of your arguments. I think it's the one that really changed. And and again, I didn't know about it until I saw the red pill. So this is new to me. I didn't know you had written a book about this because I entered graduate school just before you wrote that book and you were read out of polite society and academia. Basically, you weren't mentioned then at all. And this is why I think I didn't know about you until just recently. But can you just go over what the the argument was and the myth of male power, which I just I think it just it's a it's a it's a revolutionary just way of thinking about history actually that people don't do i mean they just don't think of history in this way and and how men and women have been treated uh, and I certainly didn't, which I was, I'm actually embarrassed to admit that until I saw you talk about it in, in the movie. So what is that book and why did the feminists hate it so much? Yes, um, it, it was called The Myth of Male Power and it basically said that power is about the freedom to be able to be in control of your own life. 
and that historically speaking, neither sex had power. Mm -hmm. Both sexes had obligations, both sexes had responsibilities. And that women's set of obligations were to raise the children and, they, and women, no matter what their personalities were, were pressured into doing that. And women risked their lives uh, bearing children. And men were pressured without regard to their personality into fighting in the war. Mm -hmm. They had to register for the draft and they were recruited and they got received social bribes to be willing to be disposable, as I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And um, because we all wanted love and approval and respect and we all, in, in strict families that we grew up in historically, we had to do what we were told to do. Uh, we learned from the very early years to, to do what you needed to do as a woman. And if you really loved a man who didn't earn money, you weren't allowed to marry him as, you know, the Titanic movie so famously mm -hmm. illustrated. And historically speaking, if you were a man who wanted to raise, to write books or be an artist, and, um, you know, unless you were uh, gay and you broke off from the world and society in those years, um, you were, um, you had to, to do what, not what fulfilled you, but what earned you money. And so when men got married to women, they started to feel like if they were a, an elementary school teacher or a kindergarten teacher, and this was their passion, that passion was not the issue. You needed to quit being an elementary school teacher to become a principal or get out of education altogether if it paid too little, get into something that paid more, like selling insurance. from. And if you sold insurance locally, um, that you should consider it a, a privilege um, and power if you were put on, um, made to sell insurance given the opportunity to sell insurance nationally. Um, but no one allowed you to think to yourself, wait a minute, is selling insurance nationally going to take me away from my children mm -hmm. and have me experience a father's catch-22 that I learned to love the children by being away from the love of the children mm -hmm. and where you know my wife often feels lonely and doesn't have me uh, to talk through things with and you know then we end up with a divorce. We feel psychologically divorced. This is not power. This is a set of obligations that fortunately the women's movement is encouraging women to think the think through these straitjackets of femininity so that if a woman is a brilliant woman who has ambition and would like to have a, a, an opportunity to make a difference in the world, we should free her to do that. But she, who should she be marrying? She should Her heart should be open to marrying a man who, if she wishes to have children, is more oriented toward loving children and nurturing children and being home with those children so she can have the freedom to be um, the uh, have-it-all woman, mm -hmm. uh, a woman who can have... Uh, breakthrough glass ceilings, so to speak, uh, a woman who can have uh, children raised um, effectively at home, and a woman who can have a loving uh, marriage as well. And so by not, and so the myth of male power was saying, um, let's not, this is not a world uh, in which men um, were were oppressing women mm. um, for their own benefit. This was a world in which both sexes had rigid roles from the past that were functional for survival. But now in those cultures where survival is not the dominating force, where the, the middle and upper middle class at least can begin to have freedom from those roles and be able to treat their children for their personalities, for their unique selves, as mm -hmm. Mark Gaffney puts it, um, uh, rather than um, just be um, um, be uh, uh, in a straitjacket of, mm -hmm. of of gender roles. Right now, you're not arguing. I, I think you've said this many times already. I just want to make it clear that that it wasn't women forcing this on men or men forcing this on women. It was. Am I right that uh, we have internalized these gender roles and expectations and norms ourselves? Right. So when asked, you know, in 1939, you know, a man in New Jersey would have said, well, men should go to war. Of course, yes. women shouldn't go to war. Right. I, sh I should go to war, not her, right? And women, most women, the vast majority of women, even then would have said, oh no, women should stay at home and not go to war. They should raise children. Sure. Right, they believed it themselves, and what you're saying is they were straightjacketing themselves in doing so. Is that right? Yes, they were straightjacketing themselves okay. um, because, but also being straightjacketed by the need to survive. Survive, right? Um, because we are now post scarcity in a post scarcity society, so the, we, the need to survive is less urgent. Yes, okay. less urgent. We're not in a post scarcity, gotcha. but we're in a less. Less, less scarcity yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, oriented, and at least the middle and upper middle class have a type of freedom. You know, I, I was teaching my couples class um, this past weekend at mm. uh, 14, 1440 Multi University. Mm. And this is a class teaching people how to be able to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. Mm. And um, and I made it really clear to everybody in the class is that we are all we are all the children of privilege, and that privilege has been created 
by our parents' ability to earn enough money that has freed us to be able to have the education and the focus to earn the type of money that can now allow us to worry not about survival, but about being able to communicate, moving from role mate to soul mate. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm there teaching them for a weekend is the what I call the art and discipline of love. Mm. But the art and discipline of love is not something our grandparents were talking about. Mm -mm. They just got married and she did what she had to do and he did what he had to do and neither of them felt really loved or understood. Um, But you were what you were, you were doing what you were, what you were told to do roles wise. And so the feminist movement made a great contribution to the world by freeing women from the rigid roles of the past but it made a terrible contribution to the world by calling men the oppressors Mm -hmm. um, and women the oppressed. That is a fundamental misunderstanding of the evolution of human beings Mm. and also of animals. Mm. You know, even among animals, like, you know, almost 85% of the reproduction among among almost all animals is by the female with the alpha male, the number one. And an example of that is the um, uh, buck elks, for example. Um, the, the females almost always marry the alpha male that has the biggest um, rack. Um, but that biggest rack, in order to get that biggest rack, the alpha male has to consume um, about uh, 30% of his minerals and nutrition and calcium. And so the alpha male is so... Um, and if that alpha male doesn't get rid of that big rack immediately um, by uh, r- um, doing the rutting process, um, um, getting rid of that rack by rubbing it, rubbing it against the, a tree, um, that alpha male will be likely to die before the winter season because mm. it can't replenish its nutrients. Right. And that's a perfect example of what masculinity is about, that men's weakness is our facade of strength. Yes. And the female is attracted to that facade of strength because that those that 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 rack can be used to kill off enemies but what is not considered is that rack also kills, kills him, him off that's as right. well and that's what the core of the myth of male power is about yes. that men's weakness is their facade of strength it is not liberation it only it's, it appears as power but the price of getting that power is powerlessness yes an actual death an actual death that's yes right. exactly warren I want to thank you for doing this, and I want to thank you for putting ideas into the world that made me freer. Thank you. That's really one of the nicest things that could be said about the myth of male power or the boy crisis or any book I've written. Your your whole career, I think, has created a world in which I can do many more things that I uh, couldn't have done before you did it, and I really appreciate that. And I hope it frees women to have men that are free to do the types of things like raising children that men and that will serve women who really want to make it um, in the world uh, in a in an impact type of way. Yeah. Well, keep going and good luck at the White House. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To get more information and to buy tickets for the upcoming Renegade University weekend in Oakland and San Francisco in April go to renegadeuniversity.com backslash live. Thanks for listening.